This morning's scripture reading comes from the prophet Micah from the Hebrew Bible. And if you'd like to follow along in your bulletins, you're welcome to do so as the text is printed there. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? What have I, in what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and I redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord." With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before God with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? My uh, grandfather was of very humble beginnings, um, middle and end. Uh, he was a humble man. He, uh, he was born just uh, north of Arkansas uh, in Missouri. He uh, worked for a time in Kansas City building houses with a, a crew of men and built a lot of houses leading up to the 50s or so. And then he retired to a farm in a small community, near a small community called Adrian, Missouri. He never flew on an airplane. He never went to college. I don't think he went to high school. I'm pretty sure he never took a train ride. He did drive a car. The one I remember most vividly is a 1959 Chevrolet. I don't know if you remember that car. It was the year that Chevrolet decided that the fins shouldn't go vertically but go sideways. He almost flew with that car. Uh, he used to chew tobacco and spit it out on the side of the car. Ugh, what a terrible habit. He, uh, he had a humble life in many ways. He showed me uh, a lot of things. Uh, he, he taught me how to use a hammer. He, he showed me how to start uh, a cut with a handsaw so that it would glide smoothly all the way through and you could slice through a board quickly. And oh boy, did he eat breakfast in the most remarkable way. I, some of you, I've told this before, but, but he used to like his bacon so crisp that it died on the plate and disappeared the minute you touched it. His eggs were the runniest eggs you ever saw, and he loved sorghum molasses. There was always sorghum molasses there. He'd take some sorghum molasses and some butter, and he'd whip it up into a concoction on the plate, and he'd take a piece of bread and tear it in half, and in a single motion, just go like that. Mm me too. I love sorghum molasses. I learned that from him. He showed me many kindnesses. There's a story that the family tells about how he was visiting a family member in a local hospital. And one of the, the roommate of the family member in the hospital was there for back surgery. And my grandfather had had back surgery and had trouble with his back. Uh, from riding in a tractor. By the way, he taught me how to drive a tractor before I could drive anything else. He, he, he had had back problems, and so he went up to this man who's in the hospital bed, and he just had a tremendous sympathy for him, and he, and he took the man by the hand, and he stroked his hand and comforted him. It was really an extraordinary kindness that he'd done. We tell that story because it is in contrast to another thing about my grandfather. He had many kindnesses. 
but he was a racist. He would swear at the table. He would use the N-word liberally. And what was interesting about that man is that that man was a black man that he he touched the hand with, that he gave comfort to. And that was an incredible contrast to the thing that my grandfather spewed from the kitchen table around that breakfast table and lunch, and he would grumble and complain. He loved to listen to the baseball game on the radio, but if, if some player fouled up a play, he, he blamed it on their race if they were a black player or a, or a player from Cuba. He would be in an outrage. It wasn't because there was a good pitch. It was because of their race that they fouled it up. And he blamed many of the problems on the world on the issue of race. He was wrong. He was terribly wrong. And this very kind man had this incredible, cruel streak. This humble man who didn't make huge differences in the world made this difference. You would think it didn't matter much because it's confined in his little kitchen and didn't go very far but it's 60 years ago that I'm remembering, and it still has an impact today. I think Norman Lear was thinking of my grandfather, by the way, when he did All in the Family, Archie Bunker. Uh, but Archie was mild to what my grandfather would do. His influence wasn't all that great, but everyone's influence is not all that great. So in the book of the prophet Micah, there's several chapters, but chapter 6 is the one that we remember. It's, it's required reading for almost everybody, I believe. We ought to listen to what is required for us. It ought to be, it, it is, it's written lots of different places. It's an important thing for us to remember. And what it says, what, what Micah communicates, what he claims about God is that God is not interested in whether we cross ourselves this way or this way, whether we use, we use holy water or regular water, whether we have grape juice or wine, that the little differences between us, they, they're not that important. They're not required of us. They're, they're not the things that matter. What matters most Simple kindness, of course, don't you know? Don't we love kindness? Don't we enjoy it when people are kind to us? Isn't it gratifying when we find ourselves being kind to another? That is required to love kindness. This matters. But that is not enough in itself because to love kindness can be too narrow, too selective, what is called of us also is to, is to do justice. And justice is really not much more than extending the kindness that you would give to anyone, to everyone. The kindness that you would have for your friend or family would be the kindness you would extend to all people. It is to understand that in God's time, every child is a child of God. Everyone, everyone is welcome in God's world. God's kindness, our kindness Extended beyond is what it means to do justice. The goodness of my grandfather, I loved him dearly. He, we called him Pop when we were choosing names for me when I became a grandfather. I wanted to be Pop. I loved my grandfather, but he was wrong about this. I don't know how you reacted this week. But it was one more time where the cruelty of racism was clear again, that not all human lives are valued the same, that it's, that it's apparently all right to brutally kick and kill a young person in the street. That's wrong, and it's wrong because it hasn't extended the kindness that you would expect, that you would expect for your own children and all of your neighbors. It's wrong because it devalues human life in a way that shouldn't be. We are called, we are called by God to do justice in our humble ways, in the simplest, most effective way that we know how to try to give people, all people, the benefit of the doubt, a home, food, the pleasures of human kindness. 
this is what is required, that we love kindness, that we do justice, that we walk humbly with God.